Good evening, everyone. We are so excited to bring you a panel discussion this evening. Um, this is the first time we've had multiple brands on at once. We're really excited. This is in honor of our Keep It Local sale. So we have five amazing New Hampshire producers here with us tonight. Uh, welcome, welcome to the event. We're so excited that you could join us here on Zoom and on Facebook tonight for those of you tuning in live on Facebook. Uh, I am, I'm Carol Ann, your moderator for this evening. I'm going to be asking all of the brands the different questions. And then at the end of the event, we'll also open it up to, for some of your questions. So if you have any questions that you are wanting to answer, please go ahead and leave those in the chat on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to the brands. I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you in alphabetical order. So kicking things off, we have Copper Cannon Distillery. Take it away, Blake. So I'm Blake Amaker. I am co-founder of Copper Cannon Distillery in Westchesterfield, New Hampshire. Um, we've been open for around three years, um, actually a transplant into New Hampshire from Louisiana. Uh, I also have a full-time job as an aerospace engineer. So this is uh, my very expensive hobby that's become, you know, a pretty decent sized business for us. So um, I'll pass the baton to the next person. And so next up we have Brian from Flag Hill Distillery and Winery. Hi, my name is Brian Ferguson. Uh, I own uh, Flag Hill Winery and Distillery in, in Lee, New Hampshire. We have a catering company here. We also have uh, uh, some short-term rentals so you can come stay with us now they just got open last year we're real excited about um we're really focused on growing aromatic white varietal lines that's what we that's what we uh focus on and, and produce in, in in the highest quality we can uh we're really excited about what what's coming out of our facility right now uh and uh we also are one of the only farm distilleries in the country we grow all of our grain for our whiskey production we're, we're really excited about it uh, we started doing it a few years back uh, and it keeps into our general uh, theme and, and, and motto of, of quality input in is equal to or greater than quality of output out. Uh, you can't make something better than the sum of the parts. So if we have control of the raw in ingredients, we know that uh, we're going to produce the, the best possible uh, best possible product on the other side of it. Awesome. And next up, we have Bob from the Hermit Woods Winery in Delhi. Hi, I'm Bob Manley. I'm one of the co-founders. Uh, founded uh, Hermit Woods Winery 10 years ago with two partners, Ken uh, Hardcastle, who's our winemaker, and uh, Chuck Lawrence. And uh, like I said, we've been in business for 10 years. Uh, we are now a winery and a deli. We have, uh, we serve food out of our deli. Uh, so we're open seven days a week. We provide wine tastings and tours to our guests. And most recently, we just opened our, our third floor into what we're calling the loft, which is going to be a, a music venue and an event space. So we'll be uh, offering private and public events here. And uh, soon we'll be doing live uh, listening room shows, hopefully attracting artists from around the world to come play here at, at Hermit Woods Winery. And, uh, and just recently, we. Uh, purchased property next door to us and we're opening up a beer and wine garden for the summer and we're going to serve beer and wine out on the out on the lawn of the property next door and we have some food trucks coming in and we're going to be offering some wine slushies and it'll be a nice addition to the uh, the winery experience that we hear that we have here uh, at the at the original winery so I hope uh, hope everybody gets a chance to come visit us someday and check out our new our new digs so awesome. And so next up, we have Peter from the Stark Brewing Company. Peter, I'm going to, you're on mute. Sure. Can you hear hey. me now? Yes. Hello. Sorry. I've had a computer technology nightmare 24 hour, 48 hours. My email was disappeared and my internet went down and my Wi-Fi was broken. So I'm having problems with computers today. Um, Long story short, I'd like to tell you a lot of really great things, but I've got kind of a sad story. Uh, my brewer distiller, Paul Davis, who was working for me for the last seven years, and my best friend passed away just recently, uh, was very sick and was sick the last eight months or so. But uh, going forward, I hired a new distiller who has 20 years of experience. He came from uh, Minnesota um, through Tampa, and he is now working in distilling for me. And... We are all excited because he wants to do a whole bunch of new products and he's got 
really great experience in doing that. So I'm pretty excited about what he's going to be bringing to the table. Uh, we are a brewery distillery. I've been here for 27 years. We've been distilling for just the last five years, maybe six years. Uh, we have a few products on the market, but like I said, during COVID was very rough for me. I'm not sure about how all you guys did, but it was not uh, a great time. And I'm so looking forward to getting out of this COVID mess and these masks and everything else. And um, business at my place has been picking up quite a bit. And we are in the process of building um, a beer garden outside. Uh, we had tables in a parking lot last summer and this year we're making it very nice with plants and heaters and lights and murals. The city's allowing me to paint on the bridges and we're gonna make a nice beer garden outside and looking forward to the future. Um, had a, like I said, had a rough year, but hopefully we're getting out of it and I'm looking forward to doing events with the Liquor Commission like this. So I'm excited. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you tonight, Peter. And I would just like, before before I let Lewis introduce himself, let's all just raise a glass of whatever we're drinking to a better year to come, okay? <laughs> Amen to that. So, um, Lewis we, from Sweet Baby is here tonight. Those of you who have tuned into some of our live events previously, you may have met him. Lewis, I think, is the person I have gone live with the most besides Mark and Lisa. So, he he's going to He's a great person to have on live with you. So I'll let him talk now. <laughs> well, thanks again for having me. You haven't gotten sick of me yet, which is awesome. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm Lewis Eaton, owner of Sweet Baby Vineyard. I am the winemaker, delivery guy, fix it person, wine tender, pretty much a you know, head cook and a cheap bottle washer around here, along with my wife and my four kids. Uh, we run Sweet Baby Vineyard. Uh, we're, a, we're a small family-run farm right here in Hampstead, New Hampshire. Produce about 26 different kinds of wine. We got sparklings, we've got fortifieds, we've got still wines, and we specialize in New Hampshire-grown fruit, uh, primarily from Applecrest Farms and um, stuff we grow, grapes from Flag Hill that we purchase as well as our own, and um, blueberry wines from uh, Taylor Brown Blueberry Company up in Alton, New Hampshire. Um, yeah, that's kind of our passion is to see what we can make out of the locally grown stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for your quick intros. Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, I do want to mention that our live feeds on Facebook now have auto-generated captions. So uh, if anything seems weird, just know that those are auto-generated by Facebook. So I can clarify anything that comes up for you. Somebody did already have a question about one of those captions that didn't come through right. So don't you worry, just shoot us a message on Facebook and I'll take care of anything that you need. So uh, now we're gonna get into some of our bigger questions. We have some great topics that we're gonna cover tonight with these awesome brands. So uh, Blake, back to you for why did you choose to start your distillery here in New Hampshire? So I think it was a function of me moving to the Northeast. Um, so my cousin and I, so he's a petroleum engineer. He works in Houston and I'm an aerospace engineer. So I worked at Raytheon in Massachusetts for a while. And then I ended up moving to the Keene location. And I think it was just a function of, you know, my area. I was, you know, I, I moved away from my family and, you know, I was bored after, after working at around four, I was pretty much bored and was dying for another project. So, I probably should have talked to Brian before I jumped into this huge project, but I started this side, this side hustle of uh, the, of a distillery and it just became, it blossomed into what is Copper Cannon. And, you know, we've, being from Louisiana, you know, I have a, a focus on rum. Our brand is, is mainly focused around uh, molasses-based fermentation. And I thought it fit, fit really well for the area because New England has a, has a history of rum-based products in their, uh, pushed into their history. And I thought it was really good to take what I know from Louisiana and what I've experienced in Louisiana, plus my engineering background and incorporate that into two of our focus products are our aged rum and our maple rum. And we just submitted those to uh, San Francisco, um, the San Francisco competition, spirits and wine competition. We won gold for those two products and then they're featured in the state stores also. So, I mean, we also have, you know, bourbon and stuff like that that are in barrels, but uh, 
the main reason we moved to New Hampshire was just, it was just a function of me being here. I mean, we debated on putting it in Louisiana. We debated on putting it uh, in, in um, Texas, but it just, we got the right location. If you've ever seen our barn, it's uh, in this historic, it's from a barn that was basically pieced together from two different, um, um, a Bardwell farm barn and another bottling facility that was in um, on Emerald Street in Keene. It's got huge beams and it's just a beautiful building. Um, and it just felt right for our distillery. And I worked out a really good relationship with the guy who actually owns the building. And it's just evolved into this huge hobby slash business, you know, and it's been great. Um, and we've been growing and it's just everything feels right right now in New Hampshire. So Brian, same question, but I'd also like to ask what came first for you, the winery or the distillery? So uh, the distillery was my, uh, that's kind of my trade. Distilling is my trade. Um, I started at Finger Lakes Distilling in upstate New York. Um, and uh, I was working, I was very, very, very fortunate. And I got to work under Thomas McKenzie as a fifth generation master distiller. Uh, and then I got an opportunity to move to Grand Cayman. I was the head distiller for Cayman Spirits Company. Um, and uh, then I moved here uh, after making rum in the Caribbean for a while. Uh, and the intention was actually not to be here that long. Um, I was just looking to get back into the U.S. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, New Hampshire was kind of the, the first stop. Uh, and we were, I was actually working on starting a distillery in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'd been here for a couple years. And the, uh, the previous owner of Fly Kill approached me about, um, about uh, he was looking to retire and, and it seemed like a really good fit. So uh, we, me and my wife, Maddie, uh, bought the, uh, the facility about, uh, I think it was June, June 11th of 2015, uh, which is about six or seven days after my first child was born. Uh, so it was a, it was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a crazy time. And uh, for, as far as the, what came first here, um, it was the, uh, the winery. The winery has been here since uh, the early nineties. And <clears throat> I think there was plantings as early as 87 or 88, uh, but they didn't officially become a winery. And so I think it was 94. Um, and uh, we have slowly evolved uh, over time. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, to answer the question about why uh, why New Hampshire? There's a, there's a lot of um, a lot of reasons why. Um, it, surprise, it was shocking to me when I moved here uh, how much I loved it. Um, I didn't know uh, I didn't know how amazing the state was, how much it has to offer uh, when we first moved here. Um, and then when we started, you know, really delving into the winemaking and the, and the spirit side of things, um, there is so much opportunity. Uh, when we started growing our grain, we have we actually have a pretty we have excellent soil. Uh, here where we are. Uh, we have excellent soil for growing grain for corn and small grains like rye and wheat, uh, things of that nature. Um, and the other, the other amazing thing is we have this incredible opportunity on the winery side of the equation here. Uh, we, we grow these incredible hybrid grapes um, that when made in certain styles, uh, specifically we, we believe that aromatic white wines uh, here in New Hampshire are, are kind of the ticket to making world-class wines. And so we, uh, we have this incredible climate where we have these, uh, these really nice, cool fall. So we have a perfect growing season. Um, and then we have this uh, really nice, cool fall, um, these nice, cool fall mornings, right? So we can pick the, the, the grapes at a really, really nice, cool temperature. Um, and and this, is, this is important because when you're making aromatic white wines, the number one contributor to aromatic wine quality is temperature. I mean, if we break the barrier at 60 degrees Fahrenheit versus... Uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to, we're going to keep trap much more of those aromatic compounds than if we broke the barrier at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so really being here in, in, in this climate gives a, an incredible opportunity to make these, uh, you know, off dry and semi-sweet aromatic white wines that are just unbelievable. And, uh, and we're really, really, really excited, excited about. Um, it's um, uh, the other thing that's, that's really great. Um, and uh, this is shameless, but the New Hampshire Liquor Commission is excellent. Um, uh, this is, uh, I've, I've been in a lot of different places, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, happy to plug, uh, the New Hampshire Liquor Commission because it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great, um, 
it's, it's really great for small producers to be able to get their products out there. It's, it's difficult um, in some of these other markets uh, to, to really have market penetration uh, and as a small producer to be able to get your, to get your product out there. Uh, so another, you know, another answer to the reason why New Hampshire um, is uh, it, it's a, it's a great way. It's, it's an easy state for consumers to have customers to have access to the products that small producers are, are making uh, in, in almost any location. You know, if we, if we were just doing it all our, ourselves, it'd be hard to, to get all the way up there to Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh area. Um, uh, and we're able to do that through, through, the, through the commission. Awesome. So now next up is Bob. So Bob, why did you and your partners choose to start the winery in here in New Hampshire? Well, I, I think Brian actually summed up a lot of the great reasons to start a winery in New Hampshire. Um, and quite frankly, I, I've actually had the, the good fortune of traveling in every state in the country. And I personally think New Hampshire is one of the most beautiful states there is. And I'm really happy to have landed here and uh, probably going to finish out my life here in this state. And so, so really, I, I can't think of many better places to have landed and started a business uh, like like we did here uh, with Hermit Woods Winery. Um, all, all of my partners have been here for at least 30 years. One of my partners uh, has his family's back three or four generations. So um, there's a lot of history here in New Hampshire for us. Um, before we started the winery, we, uh, we were taking full advantage of all of the wonderful things that New Hampshire has to offer. Um, we, were, we became friends uh, before we were partners, uh, mountain biking all of the, the trails and mountains throughout the, the lakes region and beyond. And uh, so there's just so many reasons that, uh, to live and to, to work here in this beautiful state. Um, and especially here in the lakes region where we are. Um, I can't imagine being anywhere else actually right now. So uh, that's, that's one reason. Another, another great reason is at Hermit Woods, we, we made a decision early on that we really wanted our winery to be about this space, this, this part of the world, and craft wines from the fruit that grows here in this part of the world, and, and, uh, and sort of set ourselves apart. I mean, there's, there are people making wonderful grape wines all over the world, um, but there's relatively few people uh, working with the, the, the native fruits from the, from the different parts of the world that are other than grapes. And so, uh, it's been exciting for us. We're paving some some new trails and uh, and and discovering some some new uh, approaches and new ways to to produce uh, dry style, uh, barrel aged, ageable fruit wines that uh, that stylistically drink uh, very much like like wines you might be familiar with from the wine regions of the world. So uh, so it's also we're able to sort of set ourselves apart by being here in New Hampshire and uh, do something a little bit different than. Than, uh, than the rest of the world is doing. And, I, and to, to parrot a little again what Brian said, I'm, I'm just amazed at uh, how much, this is a, it's a small state, how much access that I have to, you know, when I, when I need support from the, the Liquor Commission, I, I can get somebody on the phone and get the support that I need in, in no time at all. And I can't tell you how important that is. Um, I've, I uh, lived in California for a long time and, and that was not the case there. So um, it's, it's, been, it's very meaningful to me that I've, I've had access to, to our state leaders, our legislators, our, our, uh, our uh, uh, the, the Liquor Commission. And, and when you're running a small business, it's really important to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to communicate with the people that are, that are establishing the rules and the laws that guide your business. And uh, so that's been really special, and it's made it it's made it a lot easier for me to, to have a successful business. So another another good point. Thank you, Brian, for bringing that up. So yeah, that, that's basically it. I, I can't I can't imagine. And I think my partners would agree. I can't imagine doing this anywhere else. So. so Peter, same question, but I'm also curious. So you mentioned that you have only been distilling for five or six years. How long have you been making beer? Um, here in Manchester, right near my office. So I come and have lunch with you sometimes. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Sorry. There you are. Anyways, uh, I seem to be the only homegrown New Hampshire person here. But um, I've lived in New Hampshire and Manchester my entire life. I have a long time here. I've been at Stark Brewing Company uh, since 1994. Uh, for 27 years, 
I've been brewing beer and I started brewing beer in 94 and I've been brewing beer for that long length of time. I haven't done much over the last 10 years, except recently since my brewer got sick. Uh, I have been brewing the last six months or so. It's actually fun to get back into it. And um, Manchester, the mill yard, 27 years ago, I thought it would be a great idea to bring the first brew brewery to New Hampshire. Um, while I was building other breweries open, two other breweries open, but I was I ended up opening in 94. I started in 92 and I built, brought a brewery to New Hampshire. I thought that was the thing to do then. And I have all kinds of different beers on tap here. Uh, a lot of them we won over, myself have won over 30 medals and Paul had won over 40 medals. Paul was a great brewer. We have all those beers here and Paul and I started just fooling around with distilling with another distiller and who came in to work for me. And we, we thought it would be a great idea to bring a distillery to New Hampshire. Um, there weren't a lot here at that time, five years ago. Who was distilling? How many people were distilling five years ago in New Hampshire? Mark, maybe you know that answer. Were there a lot of them? It's kind of grown recently, but Mark Roy, is, was there a lot of distilleries five years ago? I can't give you an exact number, but I can guarantee it was probably under 10 would be my guess. So there weren't a lot, I think under five, maybe even. So yeah, I thought it would be a great idea to go with. I have a brew pub and a restaurant and I've always been a person who liked quality products. So I was that way with beer and I came kind of a snob with liquor also and wanted to get some really good products and we came up with some pretty good stuff. I'm really, I was very impressed with a lot of the products we came out with our bourbon and our vodka and our rum and our coconut rum. They just came out really good and I'd like to expand on it. And we had plans, but the last, like I said, the last 18 months have been very difficult, but now I think I'm back on track to increase my different products and make some different new stuff. And I'm very excited about the new distiller I have. He has a ton of experience and that's what I was looking for. I don't have much experience at all in distilling. I can tell you a lot about brewing. As a matter of fact, I'm brewing right now. So I may need to step away for a little while. I'm brewing a double batch of beer as we speak. I have two guys helping me out. So as a Manchester born and bred person, been here my whole life. My kids grow are here in high school. Uh, don't plan on going anyplace, although I wish I had my brewery distillery someplace warmer, but uh, we'll live with it. And I enjoy working with uh, you guys at the Liquor Check Commission. Mark, you guys have been great. You know, doing the, the still showcase was a phenomenal event and, you know, things like that and doing the tastings. Are we allowed to do tastings in stores again? I guess that's one question I wanted to bring up again. Has the state opened up to doing uh, personal tastings yet? Um, like to start doing them. Most of my products sold very well when they were tasted. Um, not as easy a time when I don't do tastings as I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. So thank you all for everything you do. Uh, Brian, you've been a big help in the distilling part, and you guys are doing some great stuff. I've tried a few of your different things. Love them. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And it's really excited to see guys like you guys doing with your passion and your knowledge and the quality of products you're putting out is really great to see. So pretty proud of, uh, of uh, our state and what we've come up with, the small group of distillers we have that have done such a good job with products. It really is. Um, there's a lot of products out there that come from other states that I don't think so highly of. But I got to be honest, I've never had really many bad things to say about any New Hampshire products. And everyone I've tried have been really good. So keep up the good work, guys. And thank you guys at the commission for everything you do. So appreciate it. Awesome. And so I, now... answer your... oh. <laughs> I don't think I answered your question, but. No, you did. You did good. Um, so, Lewis. Same question for you, I, but why did you choose to start your winery here in New Hampshire? But I believe you are also a New Hampshire native. Is that correct? That's right. That's why I was doing the Excellent. head. Excellent. <laughs> All, right. All right. I'm glad to see you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my, my, my father's family was uh, kicked off the Mayflower. They made it to Seabrook, New Hampshire, but, you know, and, and uh, kind of stayed there. So I grew up literally, you know, about 30 miles from my winery. I've lived in New Hampshire for uh, 49 years, going on 50 this year. Um, the reason I started my winery here is obviously because I had roots. Um, when I started the winery, I had two children. I had now have four. Uh, I went through, you know, all school, all through college, everything here. Um, 
And my wife, uh, you know, she jumped the border. She's from Massachusetts originally, but, you know, she's been here for 42 years, so in this wow. state. Um, but this is our second go at having a farm in New Hampshire. We, uh, we've moved literally three times. Um, each time we've upgraded. So we started in Kensington, New Hampshire back in 2008. Very rapidly outgrew that spot. Um, like Blake, we thought it was going to be, you know, a, a hobby, kind of a glorified hobby, and hopefully it would pay for itself. And it took over my, my job as a uh, heavy highway construction supervisor. I was running giant jobs down through Massachusetts, uh, building bridges and, um, you know, uh, new roads and things like that. And, uh, yeah, I, I certainly like doing this a lot better. I'm home for more meals than uh, I ever have. And I, and I missed a lot of my kids' childhood. So that was kind of our, um, my big motivation of, of making this work. And thank God the Liquor Commission has helped us out. We've got some great farmers that we've stuck with since the beginning that provide us really quality fruits. Um, to make our, our you know, world-class uh, quality wines. And I believe, this is a shameless plug for us, um, I think we've been the top seller in the liquor stores for at least seven years. And we've had the number one selling product for at least 11 years, which is our blueberry wine, go figure. Um, pretty crazy, we've cracked the top 500 on the top 1200 list every year for, I don't even know how long, probably a decade which is pretty neat. So thank you guys. And, and to mirror everybody else, um, the Liquor Commission has been wonderful to, uh, to work with as well. Um, as you know, in the capacity that I was up until recently, I was the president of the New Hampshire Winery Association for six years. And um, they are a great tool and um, they answer every question perfectly for us and uh, speak to us at, at a human level and not like an administrative level, which uh, is, is definitely welcome. And I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thanks everybody. So before we move on to question two, uh, we do have a question for Lisa from the audience. Uh, Lisa, one of our viewers is wondering, did we carry Flag Hill products in the liquor stores before Brian was making them? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. My mute wouldn't go off. <laughs> Wine. Um, so yes, um, we did carry the wines prior to Brian, um, but we we started carrying a few more after Brian um, came into the picture and, and bought the vineyard. So, but we did carry them prior to. Awesome. Uh, and then just before we move on to that second question, I did want to mention for everybody tuning in tonight that, so this event is kind of in honor of our Keep It Local sale that's going on right now. So uh, I think it's, you know, it's been going on for about a month and a half now, but through the end of June, you can get 20% off your purchase of uh, three or more bottles of New Hampshire made wine and spirits. So I know a few of you here watching on Zoom did pick up a couple bottles of wine to taste along with us tonight. I hope everybody else will go take advantage, try some fabulous New Hampshire made products. Uh, great time to give them a try while you can get that 20% discount. So now... Let's go to our second question. So we're going to go back to Blake with uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you face being a New Hampshire based distillery? Well, first off, I want to, I want to just give the New Hampshire Liquor Commission props because that was the only one who didn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, you know, it's, I guess, I guess when you start it, it it depends on your situation that some of these challenges i mean if you're if you're full in it's your full-time job i think it's uh it becomes a lot easier but you have to remember so i was working like 40 50 hour a week job on top of this so i think time management was a big challenge for me and then starting a distillery i mean i think a lot of people romanticize the the the, the oh i own a brewery or i own a distillery but if you, if you start to listen to a lot of these panelists, I think a lot of them, particularly in New Hampshire, are aligned in the fact that they're all trying to strive for quality products. And I think that's, a, that's you, you might not necessarily see that in other locations or you see a lot of rectifiers who are just pulling, pulling stuff. But, you know, I've known Brian. I mean, Brian and I have become fast friends through, you know, just 
knowing each other through owning distillers, but also through the New Hampshire Craft Spirits Organization, which we helped form. Um, you know, it's, I mean, there's, there's always a day with a challenge, right? But I think, I think the common thread between all of, all of us, if you start to really listen, is the love for what we do. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these guys, um, the core, the core base is like making really quality products and, you know, really pushing those out to the public. As far as, as far as challenges, I think some of the challenges we have in particular is, you know, the rural setting and the, uh, the population associated with New Hampshire and getting the, getting the, continuing to generate the revenue and pe keeping people curious about coming to see our brand and, and understanding our brand, you know, We've actually taken a step uh, further and hired a, a local marketing company that was in, in Keene, New Hampshire, um, to help really market Copper Cannon and really get our name out there because we're, we're really focused on our, you know, a quality run brand is, is our primary mission. Um, you know, there, there are all kinds of challenges and Brian's probably been through like a thousand more than I even understand, but um, you know, you know, just from getting the permits um, from federal government through the state, uh, working with the city, fire ordinances. I mean, there's a lot of challenges associated with opening a distillery. I mean, I think secretly the running joke between Brian and I is it's easier to buy a bottle of, of alcohol than to actually make it. You know, but I think what 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 persists in a lot of these guys as you hear them talk to is is just the love for what we do. I mean, like I've heard, and I, I just know Brian better. That's why I keep picking on him a little bit. But he, I think him and I share common things where it's just like he loves distilling. And when I talk to him, he's like, this is what I want to do, right? And, you know, when I go to the distillery, it doesn't feel like a job, even though I have another job. It's really, really what I want to do and really love doing and just enjoy being productive and making good products. I don't know if I answered your question. But that's no, that was great. And Brian, you're next. So Blake has <laughs> volleyed it over to you. He, uh, he covered, he covered a lot of things in terms of what the big, the big challenges are for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing, the thing I would kind of add to a lot of what he said was originally, um, so when I started at Finger Lakes Distilling in upstate New York, the, the one thing that New York, the one thing, there's no, no, no other things other than this thing. The one thing that New York had over New Hampshire um, was uh, there was agriculture everywhere. Um, and uh, it was very easy to pick up the phone and the farmer growing the corn that I needed was, you know, 350 yards down the road or right across the lake was the guy growing the rye, or maybe, you know, a mile and a half away was the guy growing the wheat or the guy or the gal growing the wheat, right? It was, uh, um, that, was a, that was a big challenge when I moved to New Hampshire was um, I did not expect, um, I, I knew nothing, it's funny, I knew, this is embarrassing, but I knew nothing of New Hampshire other than a lot of the history of New Hampshire um, uh, when it comes to, I knew that they grew a lot of rye here for a long period of time. Um, and I knew molasses trade was a big thing in the Boston area. Uh, so I assumed um, getting my hands on, on rye would be uh, very, very simple. Um, and I was uh, shocked at how challenging it was to get grain. Uh, there's a lot of people growing fruit. Fruit's a, fruit's a pretty easy thing to, to get. Uh, peaches on some years, but other than that, everything else is, uh, is, is, is pretty easy to come by and really, really high quality. Um, and so I would say that was, that was probably our, one of our biggest challenges. And that was the reason why we decided to start growing our grain as uh, we were just really struggling to get the, the quality of, of grain that we were, we were looking for. And not, not every farmer had the ability to, uh, to have the equipment. It's a pretty, pretty capital intensive business. Grain farming is a pretty capital intensive business, uh, to do it today, um, with where the commodity price of things like corn and wheat and things like that are. So it was, uh, um, there just wasn't a lot of people doing it. Um, and so we had to, uh, and that, you know, us deciding to do it, um, uh, I, I luckily was extremely naive uh, because had I not been extremely naive, we probably would not have made the decision to do, to do it. Um, uh, Cause it's been, it's been quite a bit more challenging than I thought it, thought it, thought it was originally. Um, there is no such thing as some dumb farmer, by the way. 
Uh, those people are all uh, world-class engineers. <laughs> um, so um, I would say, you know, that's, that's probably uh, the biggest challenge, but I, I would say in general, um, even though there's, you know, little mild cha challenges like that, New Hampshire really is um, a, if it's not obvious as you look around the state, uh, it really is a Mecca for um, wine, beer, spirits, you know, all, all of the above mead. Um, we, really, we really do have um, uh, great opportunities with uh, whether, it's the, uh, whether it's the climate for growing fruit, uh, whether it's the, gr the grain that we're growing, or even the climate for aging spirits. Um, our spirits age differently than they do in other parts of the globe. Um, and, and it really provides a lot of opportunities uh, to make unique whiskeys that are, you know, our bourbon, New Hampshire bourbon does not taste like Kentucky bourbon. Um, and that's, I think, a great thing. It's, uh, um, it's, it, it's, it's incredible for the, to have the, you know, layers of diversity. If you love bourbon, uh, you need to try New Hampshire bourbon. Awesome. So then going next to Bob at Hermit Woods. Bob, what are some challenges that you guys face being a New Hampshire-based winery? I think I'd like to approach that question from two angles, uh, but before I do, I just want to second, uh, again, Brian's uh, New Hampshire bourbon is outstanding. Thank you, Brian, for you. making that. Um, uh, from, the, from the winemaking standpoint, as our winery has grown, uh, we produce somewhere between 5,000 or, or 5,500 cases of wine annually right now. So we've grown quite a bit in the 10 years that we've been in business. and. Our, our goal has always been to produce wines from the fruit that grows, right, that is able to grow right here, right in our community. Um, we don't make wine from any fruit that, that isn't able to thrive in, in central New Hampshire. Um, but as we've grown, finding the quantities of those fruits grown by farmers, you know, skilled farmers who, who can produce the highest quality fruit um, in the, you know, sometimes tens of thousands of pounds uh, locally is is extremely difficult, and uh, we we're uh, willing to pay pay to farmers top dollar for for the best quality fruit, but uh, the farmers just scale wise are not large enough in the immediate area to always produce the kinds of fruit that we that we need. So our greatest struggle has been how to how to procure the the best quality fruit as close to central new hampshire as we can as we can get it and uh, and occasionally we have to go further afield and we have to go out of the state to to find some of the fruits that we're we're trying to to work with um, i'm pleased to say that uh, whenever we do uh, meet or have access to a farmer that's willing to work with us and maybe willing to to plant additional fruit or or grow additional uh, apple trees or whatever it might be, um, we've we've uh, we've moved our our uh, fruit to the to the closest possible source. So uh, there's that's been great working with local farmers and and uh, we've had some folks who have planted uh, planted just for us uh, and we buy 100% of their of their product because they because they did so. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but uh, we've, we're up for that challenge and we've, we've had success. And the more we can bring our, our fruit back to, to New Hampshire, the better. Um, it's, uh, right now we're probably, probably about half the fruit we get is, is entirely from New Hampshire, but, but uh, that's not enough. I'd, I'd like someday for all of our fruit to come from, from right here in New Hampshire. Not that I don't mind supporting some of the other local New England states. Um, th that doesn't hurt either. But the other uh, way I want to answer this question is, is that uh, New Hampshire's, or in, at least in our industry, uh, we're not just a winery producing wine. We're also in the hospitality industry. And uh, New Hampshire is very much a tourist-based industry, at least the, the part of New Hampshire that I'm in. And uh, so that's another challenge for us is the tourism season is, is uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a constantly moving target. You know, we, you know, we're coming up to Memorial Day weekend and this is the, this is the big time of year for us. And we can pretty much count on, on uh, lots of traffic from now till October, November. But as you get into December, January and February, it can be pretty quiet around here in, in central New Hampshire. So, so managing a business, a uh, hospitality business that has to, uh, to deal with pretty significant swings in the, in the volume of, of business that we do and the, and the number of people that we see, um, and especially when we're, we're trying to maintain our business 365 days a year, seven days a week, um, it's, uh, it's a balancing act. 
Uh, one I think we've managed well, and uh, we've, we've, uh, I think we've pretty much overcome that challenge, but it, you know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. So those are the two challenges that I think are, are probably the most significant for us, is, is uh, finding, the, finding the fruit locally and the quantities we need it, and, and managing the, the significant swings in, uh, in the seasonality of, of our hospitality business here. All right, and Peter, are you, are you here or are you making beer right now? If you're just tuning in, Peter had to take a beer making break, which is probably the coolest break anybody has had to take during one of our live events. But uh, Peter, same question for you. Uh, what are some of the, what are some challenges that you face as a New Hampshire based distillery and brewery? Well, I think you're on mute. Um, just one second, guys. Sorry. All right, Peter, what about now? Oh, no. His internet was acting up earlier, and I think something's going on. All right, Lewis, same question. We'll go back to Peter in a second. What are some of your challenges? Um, to kind of echo what Bob said about uh, fruit availability, um, we, we've actually had a Good luck with it, but the price point is very high. So um, we understand we'll pay for premium fruit as well. Um, our most popular wines made from New Hampshire grown fruits are probably our lowest profit wines. <laughs> um, and the challenge is, is that, um, you know, trying to charge what they're actually worth and product placement in stores other than the liquor commission. Um, a lot of times New Hampshire wines get kicked next to the, uh, you know, the plum wines or the uh, box wines in some of the stores as well. You know, we're thankful for being there, but um, we'd like to elevate the status, uh, you know, like the Liquor Commission has done, where they put New Hampshire wines on a giant placard. It's easy to find, showcase on the Buy It Local, um, you know, uh, campaign and, and the racks in the liquor stores are huge. And we wish that other retailers would follow suit. It'd be wonderful, actually. Awesome. So it looks like Peter might still be having some technical difficulties. So we'll circle back to him. But Mark, we do have a question for you. Uh, in the meantime, one of our viewers is wondering if, if your process for selecting products to bring into the stores is different if it's a nationwide product or if it's a product from New Hampshire. Do you get to go visit the distilleries here in New Hampshire? Uh, yeah, I've been to quite a few of them. Um, I've bet, definitely been down to Flag Hill. I haven't made it out to Blake's area quite yet, but um, we do try to get around uh, once a year to visit all of our uh, local distilleries uh, and visit with everybody and, and kind of just have a, a sit down open conversation about, you know, what their business needs and, and what we need for New Hampshire and our guests here. Um, we certainly do um, try to support our local businesses uh, 110% and help them out by listing products here in our stores. Uh, unfortunately, space-wise, we can't list every product that they have. I mean, some distilleries have one or two products. Uh, Flag Hill has a wide breadth of products. You know, Tamworth Distillery has a wide breadth. So as we get more and more uh, New Hampshire distilleries and more and more products, we try to give everybody a fair shake and, and get them with a couple products out in our stores. And um, the spirit side's a little bit different. Um, as, as Lewis just mentioned, the wine side, they have a, a New Hampshire wine uh, row within the wine section in our stores. Um, the distillery side decided that they'd rather have their products um, in their section. So, you know, Blake feels confident that if we have a customer going in looking for rum, that maybe they'll see the copper cane maple rum in that rum section and, and grab that bottle on top of, uh, you know, the bottle of captain they went in for. So um, we feel on the spirit side that um, hopefully customers will be a, an add on or, or try a local spirit out of something that they see that's a, a nationally recognized brand. Cause as Brian mentioned, um, these guys put their heart and soul into these products and there's some incredible products that come right out of here out of New Hampshire, so. Awesome, thanks Mark. Uh, another viewer tuning in tonight. Actually, Mark just mentioned he hasn't had a chance to get out to Copper Cannon, but Heather tuning in tonight here on Zoom, she went two weekends ago, said it was awesome. Blake gave a wonderful tour and you guys apparently had a lengthy chat and she closed down the place. So if anybody is looking to plan a little trip this summer to anywhere in New Hampshire, you know, 
everybody we have on the line is like, well, Lewis and Brian are pretty close to each other, but everybody is really in a different location. So any, no matter where you're going in New Hampshire, you could stop in, visit one of these guys. All right. So uh, our third question was going to be all about uh, where do all of the wineries and distilleries we have on the line source their ingredients? But you guys have pretty much already answered that when you were talking about uh, some of your challenges or giving your intros. So I'm going to throw you for a loop. And so we've got this keep it local sale happening right now where people can get 20% off three New Hampshire made products. So I would like to know which three products from our stores would you recommend for people who had never tried your brand before? Um, so let's start with Blake. So I would say our three products. So we don't actually only have two products in with the state oh. liquor stores, our aged rum and our maple rum. So our aged rum is, I think, one of my favorite products. It's basically the genesis of Copper Can. It's what we really started with. A lot of people really pushed into the bourbon side or the whiskey side. We really focused on rum. So our aged rum is a molasses-based fermentation, uh, double distilled, carbon filtered. And what's unique about our aged rum is it's aged in brand new charred barrels. So they were designated for bourbon, but we didn't allow bourbon to touch them and they go straight in. They, the, the rum actually, is, you put it on ice. It's not just really a mixing rum. It's more of a premium style rum. Uh, it starts like whiskey, finishes like, finishes like rum, uh, won gold, uh, multiple, um, multiple contests, New York International Spirits Competition, San Francisco. I mean, it's just a really, really good rum. It's one of my favorite products. One of our best selling products is our maple rum. Uh, so what, uh, with the maple rum, I mean, I call it, I jokingly call it like New, Ham New Hampshire jungle juice. Because it is just, <laughs> it's it's not, it's not too sweet, but it's lightly sweetened with maple syrup. So there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's super super sweet. This one's really lightly sweetened, and the maple really really pops at the end, um, and it's just really drinkable. And it mixes with, it's kind of an anomaly in the sense that it mixes with a lot of things. We have a drink that we call the loose cannon or quitting time. Which is with just three parts of a good lemonade, and that makes a really, really excellent drink. You can drink it on ice. It mixes well with eggnog. You can make maple old fashions. I mean, it's pretty much the bomb of our products, as far as I'm concerned, as far as a seller and what people really come back for and reach for in the store. And what's really nice about it is it's actually infused with locally sourced maple syrup. And the maple syrup is actually aged in our rum barrels prior to infusing it for six months. So there's a lot of complexity within that within that rum. Um, and then I would say um, one of our third products is we, we've been seeing a lot. Of, we've started to do these uh, pre-mixed cocktails. Those have been fairly good for us as far as uh, as far as revenue generation and just people really really enjoy it. Particularly our rum punch, people really really like that one. Um, I mean, we have a gin, we have, we have potato vodka, which is from locally sourced, uh, potatoes. We have bourbon that's, uh, in barrels. Uh, we actually buy the corn through meat and Brian. We actually purchased the corn locally through, uh, Flag Hill. Uh, so that was, that was, so all those trials and tribulations that Brian went through, I just buy it from him. So, <laughs> <laughs> So like all that hard work, yeah, just purchased it. Um, so I mean, so if I had to, if I had to say that in three, you know, it's our aged rum and our maple rum, and then um, we also have, we also offer a pumpkin spiced rum, which is more of a seasonal thing that people really, really enjoy. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Uh, I <laughs> did have the privilege of visiting Copper Cannon. Uh, when was it? 2019, December-ish. And so if you have a chance to head out there, there's some great stuff happening in the, I want to call it a showroom, but that is the tasting room, excuse me. And Blake actually had maple syrup that goes into the maple room for sale. And I made some epic cinnamon rolls Christmas morning with it. Yeah. Great. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, now, Brian, so if somebody was just meeting Flag Hill in the liquor store, what three products would you suggest that they try? Um, <clears throat> I've had plenty of time to think about this, and I still don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, so I'm going to break the rules, and I'm going to call rye and bourbon the, the same. So the number one or number no, the number one that I would try is probably the rye or the bourbon. Um, I personally would lean more towards the rye, our rye whiskey, Flag Hill Straight Rye Whiskey. Um, we grow uh, some Danko and Brissetto rye here. It's beautiful stuff. Um, we are getting some uh, rosin rye in uh, real soon. We're going to be making some rye whiskey with we're real excited about. Um, and uh, my background uh, in learning to make whiskey from Thomas McKenzie, well, he was good friends with Dick Stoll. And Dick Stoll was the last great master distiller at the, the original Mictors facility in Schaeferstown, Pennsylvania. Um, and so I, I, I learned a lot about how they made the world-class, incredible rye whiskey that was, or what used to be called Monongahela style rye whiskey, or you may have heard it called Maryland or Ohio Valley rye. They're all synonyms to each other. Um, and, uh, it's very like, basically what characterizes the whiskey is it's these big grassy honey characteristics. Obviously you don't add honey. It's just the way we, uh, ferment and distill it, uh, that gives it, gives it those qualities. Um, number two, I'd say would be our sugar maple liqueur. Um, uh, it's, it's a great replacement. Any cocktail that, that you use sweet vermouth in, uh, replace with uh, sugar maple liqueur, uh, and it gives you a New Hampshire spin to, to that product. We, all the, the, the spirit that goes into that was either made from corn that we grew here at Flag Hill or apples that were grown at Apple Hill farm in Concord, New Hampshire. It's, it's, and, and all the maple syrup comes from Ben's out of, uh, uh, out of New Hampshire. Uh, so it's, it's a great locally made product. It's, it's, it's one of our best sellers. It's really, really incredible. Um, with the buy it local campaign that's going on right now, um, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely one of the ones that I'd recommend picking up. Um, it's a great time to save 20% on, on, on the product. Um, and uh, probably the third one, I'm going to jump off and go to the winery side of things. There's a lot of great spirits that we make that I'd really recommend. Um, but uh, our, our, we, something I'm very, very proud of is our, our Cuga white. Um, the Cuga white wine is an excellent example of, uh, why we can make world-class aromatic whites here in New Hampshire. Um, if you are into, uh, German style Rieslings, it's very reminiscent of a German style Riesling. We pick the berries early. Um, and this gives us, uh, the right acid balance. Um, and we arrest the fermentations early, trapping all those natural aromatic properties, it is an excellent, excellent wine. And we're about to put it in Stelvin, uh, which is really exciting because our wines are 100% quality in our tanks. But by the time they get to you in a bottle, because they're in a cork, uh, they're 90% quality. Um, by putting them in Stelvin, uh, we're going to be able to keep all that oxygen out and, and you'll be able to actually see the wines that we see in the tank. So look for that soon. Awesome. All right, Bob, you're up. Pick your three favorite wine children. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to first just start by saying that Hermit Woods produces over 32, 32 different wines. Um, we have eight of them that are uh, that we're proud to have in the New Hampshire liquor store. And of those eight, um, uh, hard to hard to choose three, but but I think I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. First and foremost, I'd like to, to talk about our our Petite Blue. Um, our Petite Blue is is uh, is our most famous wine. This was on the Today Show, Kathy Lee and Hoda, a few years back. Uh, the food and wine editor, of, uh, uh, the editor of Food and Wine magazine, selected it as the best craft beverage in New Hampshire in 2017. And actually, Oprah Winfrey suggested if you visit New Hampshire, this is the one thing you should not miss. So Petite Blue is uh, should be on your list for sure if you if you go to the liquor store. Um, it's a it's a, a, a an excellent wine. I, I wish I could say it was made from fruit in New Hampshire, but um, it's made from our neighboring state. Uh, we get over thirty thousand pounds of blueberries from from uh, Maine, and we get the wild blueberries. Those are the the little tiny berries that grow very close to the ground. Um, I, I don't even believe we could get thirty thousand pounds of wild blueberries in New Hampshire. There's not a producer producing enough of it. So uh, so but. Uh, so definitely, I would I would try our Petite Blue. Um, also, our Winnipesaukee Rosé is a really excellent uh, example of a a classic rosé made from non-classic fruit. Uh, we work with the local orchard here in Concord, and uh, that's Apple Hill Farm. They produce the uh, the apples and the cider that we use to make that wine. We get uh, cranberries from Cape Cod, and uh, it's a it's a semi-dry, uh, really nice, easy drinking. 
classically styled rosé. And the other great thing about our Winnipesaukee rosé is that 10% of the sale of the, the profits of the Winnipesaukee rosé go to the Lake Winnipesaukee Association to help keep our lake clean. Um, that's something we care a lot about. The lake is a lot of the reasons that people come here to visit us in the first place. It is also we, we get a lot of the water that we use in the production of our products. So, uh, so we care to keep our lakes clean. So if you purchase a bottle of Winnie Rosé at the liquor store, you're going to be supporting the, the, the cleaning of or the keeping clean of our beautiful Lake Winnipesaukee. And the last thing I should suggest, and, and I'm kind of cheating here, because um, we have a sample pack. So you get to try four of our wines if you pick up our new... Uh, a uh, canned sample pack. So we have, we've started canning our wines. We're right here on the shores of Lake Winnipesaukee. We have a lot of boaters that, that uh, visit our tasting room on a regular basis. And, uh, and, and I have to tell you, cans are uh, much safer and easier to enjoy on your boat. So, uh, so uh, although all of those products are still in bottle as well, for those who still want to enjoy a bottle of wine, um, we have four wonderful products, our Winni Winnie Rosé, our Petit Bleu, our hard apple cider, cranberry apple cider, and a, a, a sparkling crab apple wine comes in a sampler four pack. You can get that now. It just started being sold in the liquor store. Um, I suggest you pick one of those up and you can try four of our, our uh, favorite products. Awesome. Lisa, Laura wants to know if that is readily available in our stores or only available at select locations. Um, so the variety pack is only in select locations. Um, it's mainly in our top stores. And um, if there's a store that's near you, um, we could probably get some to you, but um, it, is, it is limited. All right, Laura, you and me, let's go get them all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got Peter. Peter is back. Peter was having some technical difficulties. So Peter, same question for you. If somebody had not had any of Stark's spirits before, which three from our stores would you suggest they pick up to try you out? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, cool. All right. So um, we have three really nice products. Our, our bourbon is very, very nice. I'm very, very happy. A lot of people are really loving it. Our vodka is really good also. I must say one day uh, I sold 47 bottles of it in, in two hours in the liquor store because people tried it and really liked it, which I thought was an amazing amount to sell. Um, and our coconut rum is really pretty cool too. We came out with that about a year ago, maybe two years ago before COVID. Uh, and it's really, really nice. People love it. Um, people have been trying it here saying, I need to get it in more liquor stores. So uh, unfortunately with my distiller getting sick, we were unable to produce a lot in the last year, but they were not, we are back producing it. We're actually making it on Friday. So we'll start it on Friday. And we age it in our bourbon barrels for a little bit more taste, uh, a little bit more oaky, smoky kind of flavor and add a little color. So those three are the three products that I'd pick to try. And one answer to answer your last question, which I kind of went offline was, one of my biggest challenges, I think everybody can relate to this, help. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> Send it to any, anybody, waitresses, cooks. Um, I need, could use some brewers, some canners, some help with the stilling, some help with everything. Um, I'm in a real bind here, owning a restaurant, brewery, distillery. Uh, banquet center and I could really use help and that's my biggest challenge and as, as I'm sure all of you can relate to. All right guys you heard it first. Great beer, great spirits. You just have to go work there. So <laughs> share this video with anybody you know looking for a job in southern New Hampshire. Um, I would also like to add so Peter and I did Facebook live together quite a few years ago and you were actually making the first batch of your bourbon when I was there and I got to try some and that was pretty special for me because I love bourbon and rye. That's cool. We're very happy with our bourbon. That's one thing I'd highly recommend you try. All right, Lewis, it's your turn. I know you have four human children, but pick <laughs> your three favorite wines. Oh, man. I definitely take the wine children over the uh, uh, human children a lot of the times. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd, I'd probably go with the, you know, uh, obvious choice, the blueberry, then the strawberry, and then the raspberry. Um, and not only does that, you know, help keep us in business buying those products, it helps keep the farmers in New Hampshire right here that we use um, in business as well. So um, to Bob's point, we're, our we're the largest purchaser of blueberries from uh, Patty up at uh, Taylor Brown Blueberry Company up in Alton, New Hampshire. We use about 
I don't know, somewhere around nine ton of blue, blueberries a year from her. And um, about six ton of strawberries from Applecrest and maybe three ton of raspberries from um, uh, Applecrest Farms as well. So that, that's a you know, huge influx of cash to these small producers. Um, yeah, so you know, and if, if you don't buy my products, buy everybody else's products too, because it's mix and match, I believe, of uh, three different yeah. varieties for 20% off. So grab one of each, take advantage of the sale. Yeah, so we've heard from each brand which three products they think you should try, but you know, give a few a try if that's what you want to do. You know, grab, grab the Stark vodka, mix it with the Sweet Baby blueberry. I may have done that in my life with some lemonade. <laughs> All right, everybody. So now we are going to get to some listener, viewer slash listener questions. Um. Lewis, actually, first one is for you. One of our viewers is wondering where the name of your winery came from. Um, so that one's a little convoluted, but uh, well, my wife's maiden last, last name was Sweet. Um, and that was given to her family when they came here from Russia. Uh, she came from a, her family came from a, from a little village that was known for candy making. And, and when they came here to uh, you know, get away from all the pressure that was on Ashkenazi Jews in, uh, in, in Europe, <clears throat> they came here and when they came through, they wanted to Americanize their name. So they, their real last name was Smirtemko. They were given the name Sweet because they came from a village of candy makers. Um, and we have, uh, you know, four children. So sweet babies, you know. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I do have questions for everybody. I'm just sorting through them. So Blake, is there an actual copper cannon at the distillery? <laughs> So uh, the name was actually generated from our first still. I actually built a, a, a copper reflux still, and it actually looks like a potato gun. So we started calling ourselves Copper Cannon. Um, so that's actually the genesis of the name. And then, you know, I was starting to look for, hey, I should buy a cannon for the distillery. And then <laughs> this is a horrible story. So then, so in 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 doing that, I was like, man, cannons are really really expensive. So I actually poured one out of concrete. I made a mold for one, poured one out of cop concrete, and uh, spray painted it copper. I mean, it's more of a of a freaking pipe bomb than a cannon. So I wouldn't shoot it. But we do have a actual copper cannon in our facility that was made by myself. Uh, but our name is actually generated from the, um, our first steel that looked like a, actually like a potato gun. If you go on our website, you can see it. Um, so, yeah, so I guess we don't have a true copper cannon, but we have a copper colored concrete cannon. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, let's see. Next question is for Peter. So Peter, you did mention that you've only been distilling for a few years, but one question that came through for you was, did you start the restaurant or the brewery slash distillery first? So we know the brewery existed before you were distilling, but were the restaurant and the brewery, did they come about at the same time? You're on mute. He may be frozen. He might be frozen and on mute. Okay, we'll go, we'll go back to Peter. Um, Bob. Perfect timing. Um, the, our audience would like to know, is there slash was there an actual hermit? And if so, can you tell us about it, him or her? Yes, that's, that's a great question. There really, there really is a hermit. Our winery started at my house about 10 miles from here. And my house was located uh, less than a mile away from a forest called hermit woods and it was called that because a, a famous hermit lived there in the 1800s his name was joseph Plummer. he lived uh, about a quarter mile off of hermit woods road in meredith and you can hike into the woods and still discover a cemetery of one he is a hermit and in that cemetery is a gravestone that actually says joseph Plummer, the hermit of meredith hill and he died in 1862 
So, uh, so we decided to give ourselves a sense of place. We decided to, uh, to take the name Hermit Woods uh, in, in honor of our local forest and our local, our local hermit. And uh, just to add to that question, we added a, uh, a snail as our logo because we didn't want Joseph to be on every one of our bottles. So we, a snail is a critter you might discover in the woods and is also representative of the slow process of making wine. That's great. All right, last question is for Brian and it's a two-parter. Uh, Brian, when will the villas be ready for me, not me, Karen Land, me, the audience member to come stay? <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> really exciting. We're actually open now. We opened last fall. Uh, so you could come stay uh, right at Fly Kill now at Rivercrest Villas. Um, you can do that through Airbnb or do it through our website, um, which I'd recommend doing it through our website. It's a little easier. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we're really excited about it. We're going to have, uh, we've got five right now and they sleep four people per, per villa. Uh, and the uh, this summer we're building the next the next five, uh, so we'll have ten for next year. Um, so if you've got a, a group of forty people that want to come stay at Flag Hill, please please come for a for a great weekend. Awesome. And then the second part of the question was, are you going to be bringing back your brunch and bubbles events? Yes. So um, we actually just had our we we just had Mother's Day brunch and bubbles, although it was the uh, plated plated version of it. Um, but at that, uh, at that event, we were uh, letting people know that Brunch and Bubbles in its old capacity and, uh, and all, uh, all of its uh, grandeur and, and excitement uh, is going to be back in, uh, in July of this year normally. Um, so we're, we're really, really excited uh, to get kind of get back to normal and, uh, and have, have that event, which if, if you've never been to it, I highly recommend. Uh, thing one coming, but thing two, um, probably getting on getting reservations ASAP. Uh, I haven't checked recently. We may, I may even be plugging something that we're sold out of now, but uh, it sells out really, really far in advance. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, looking, looking into it. It's uh, all you can drink. Well, all we can legally serve you sparkling wine uh, made from the farm here. Uh, and then uh, the food, a lot of it comes from the farm and it changes month to month based on what's, what's available uh, from, our, uh, from our farm. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. So everybody, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you to our panel for being available to join us. This was so much fun. It was great having multiple perspectives on the line. I hope that everybody tuning in will take advantage of our sale, try some of these awesome brands, do a mix and match pack, try some wine, try some spirits. But hey, if you're more of a wine person, go ahead, get three wines. We, won't, we don't judge. Same thing with the spirits. Try, some, try something new this summer you know, take advantage of the sale, get your 20% off. And if you're traveling around at all, um, maybe you're like me and you're literally running around the state doing races all over the place, you know, stop at Hermit Woods after you do your 5k or at Copper Cannon after your half marathon. No, you deserve it. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Lisa and Mark for being available. Uh, they were on fire answering questions in the chat here on Zoom about pricing and product availability. So for those of you watching, tuning in on Facebook, please be sure to pre-register for future events so you can get some of your questions answered easily as well. Um, but as always, if you need anything, please send us a direct message on Facebook. We are monitoring our messages very, very frequently. So we'll take care of you. Don't worry. So thanks again, everybody. And we will be back next week with Cathedral Ledge. Uh, and then we have a couple more other local producers who we will be live with throughout the month of June. So we'll see you soon. Have a great night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Night.